There we go. Can everybody see my slides? Quick thumbs up. Thank you, Jacob. All right. Uh, so what I'm going to take you through today is uh, some thoughts on hiring, some new hires, what we're doing about it, some key challenges, and I'll go into depth on one of those, and then uh, what we're thinking for uh, next quarter's goals, our OKRs. Um, so first, hiring. Um, here are the hires that we've made since the last FG, which I believe is April 13th. Um, so lots of people have joined. Um, really exciting. In particular, I want to highlight that uh, we continue to be uh, very global. Um, people from uh, the Asia Pacific region, uh, people from Africa, people from Europe, as well as people from North America, which is great. We're continuing to maintain our sort of status as a global company, which I'm really, uh, really excited about. Um, I'll highlight a couple of our key hires. Uh, the first is Tom Cooney, our Director of Support. Um, I've highlighted some of his relevant experience in past companies, uh, obviously coming from Zendesk, which is uh, our tool, is a very impressive pedigree, and he's already started to collaborate with Lee and Lyle, and they're starting to do some great things. So one example of the experience and breadth he's bringing is uh, he wants to bring uh, customer satisfaction, or CSAT, back in as a key metric. And so this is something I think had been turned off uh, due to a technical bug, it was not sort of a priority to us. He's sort of teaching us that like, no, this could actually be a um, more accurate representation of how customers experience support than uh, SLAs. We obviously want to measure both, but um, that may be one of, if not our main uh, key performance indicator going forward. So we're really grateful to have him and his uh, experience. Uh, and next is uh, Jerry. So uh, really excited to have our director of infrastructure here. Um, I've, uh, you know, you can see his pedigree, very experienced, but I'm, or I should say, one of the things I'm most excited about his background is that he's uh, chosen to make his life in Valencia, Spain. So as we continue to grow, as we continue to get successful and attract some of the best talent around the world, obviously there's a danger that the geography is start to zoom into North America because that's where a lot of startups are, or zoom into the Bay Area because that's where a lot of venture capital is. Um, but this shows, I think, the power of uh, remote work is that, yes, there are people out there that have, uh, you know, are deeply experienced with some of the most significant startups in the world and that nevertheless are global and, and multicultural. And I'm really happy that my, uh, my management team is continuing to be uh, international and reflect the rest of the company. So welcome to both uh, Tom and Jerry. Um, this uh, completes uh, phase one of, of my sort of personal project of uh, building an a engineering management layer. Um, and so I've got a spreadsheet that I track here. I've linked to it if anyone's curious, but phase one is essentially my immediate sort of what's called a span of control. And, uh, and Jerry and Tom are the, the last hires that complete that for me, which is great. And uh, on to phase two, which we have already taken some bites out of, but this is sort of completing the management structure in the rest of the, uh, the engineering function. I already made some hires there. Some of them haven't started yet, so I've got them crossed out. We are waiting for um, uh, two individuals to have their start dates come up, one in June, one in September. Uh, and then, you know, we keep growing. We're growing 75% in terms of headcount uh, year over year. So more positions, more opportunities are going to be opening up. So I've got phase three in here, but who knows what phase three is going to be, but we're continuing to track it and make sure that we're ahead of these needs so that teams don't find themselves without managers, so that managers don't find themselves overburdened with a number of direct reports, uh, very much paying a lot of attention to this. Um, this is what that sort of span of control looks like. This is a slide from my engineering 101 for new employees, but I figured every once in a while it's good to check in with the whole company so everybody knows what our structure is like. Of course, it's also reflected on the team chart, which is in the handbook and public to the world, uh, so you can check it out there. But these are the sort of um, eight departments that uh, comprise the uh, engineering function and represent my direct reports. And so we're starting to feel, starting to feel complete, starting to feel uh, symmetrical, and starting to feel like we can steer the ship, which is, which is an important thing. We're a large department, we're growing, um, making sure that we're all aligned requires uh, uh, really key people in important positions, uh, making, uh, um, making the most important decisions for their group and, and collaborating with me and their peers. Uh, our most important vacancies, so uh, SREs on the production team, uh, we've made a couple of good hires uh, recently, uh, not just Jerry, but uh, Devin who started and another um, SRE is going to start at the end of uh, June, in fact, a, a former Facebook SRE, which we're really excited about, but uh, we, I think we have probably three or four more to fill on that team, um, so that's one of our key roles. Then we got a engineering manager position on our database team that's been open for a while, we need to make progress on that. 
and uh, a, a lot of backend developer positions open, but particularly the monitoring team is the smallest one. We really want that team to gain critical mass and what I'm calling escape velocity, where you know we need a team of six or seven by the end of the year, and we need to really bend, uh, build around Ben, and he and Dahlia are working on that, but please refer anybody that uh, may be in your network that you know. Um, challenges. Um, you know, GitLab.com ability and performance still feels like something that we just uh, don't quite have a handle on. This is uh, for sure one of the things that Jerry is here to, to own and help us with, um, but lots to do here. Um, one of the first big steps in that is our GCP migration project. Um, I've linked to a chart on the right, you know, displaying our burn down, which shows, you know, particularly the geo component of this, we're in sort of product development mode. We're solving a lot of issues, but we're creating a lot of issues as we encounter unknown unknowns, and that means the achievement curve is essentially flat, the burn down is flat. So I literally just left a status call about that meeting and the team's working on uh, what do we do to uh, uh, fix the slope of this curve and uh, eventually get to a date that we can be sort of confident with. I've linked to the status doc for that call here if anybody wants to read the discussion that's going on in real time, but obviously something that we're spending a lot of time and effort thinking about. Um, you know, I, I talked to, you know, in the prior section, I sort of talked a lot about hiring, bragged about a lot of the hiring that's going on, but there are hot spots in the organizations, all for various different reasons, uh, where our, the pace of hiring is not matching the overall pace of hiring. So we kind of look good in aggregate across the function, but if you zoom into specific points, there's, there's various roles or various departments where we're sort of under hiring, and uh, I'm very focused uh, on, on those and helping with those. And these are some of them. Um, and then the clean interfaces, which I'll go into in the, in the next section, kind of drill into this challenge and what we're doing about it. So by clean interfaces, I'm talking about our org structure, our team names, and to some extent, our, our titles, our specialties and expertises. Um, so we wanted to make some changes here. We wanted uh, our function to be easy to understand. Um, we wanted to simplify the active release planning that, that product managers do. They need to understand like how, how, how much bandwidth do I have? How many people do I have? And we didn't have clear answers for them until uh, very recently. And, um, and then of course, we also wanna maintain functional managers for our front end engineers and our UX designers. What a lot of people do to solve this problem is just verticalize your team. Have a team that contains a front end person, a back end person, a DevOps person, a quality person, and a manager, and you're off and running. And that's a great way to uh, remove a lot of gates, ease communication, but then things like career development and things like hiring for specialized roles really goes down the tube. And we know that from our past experience, we know that from our peer companies. So we wanna maintain the structure we have, but we do wanna simplify our interfaces, and this is quite important. Um, so the sort of concept that we're all snapping around, when I say all, I mean all product development, which is not just engineering, but also uh, product management, is the DevOps life cycle. And so you've seen this uh, diagram likely on our product categories page. I've linked to it here in case you haven't. This page does evolve quite rapidly, so I encourage you to check it out at least once a month. It's owned by Sid and the product managers, uh, Mark and, and Yop, our product management leaders. Um, but this is the sort of concept they're basing around. So you're going to start to see this reflected in team names and uh, in titles more and more and more. Um, so we said that uh, individuals in the front end UX teams are going to get specialties that are attached to their titles on the team chart. And uh, it's going to reflect these, what we call DevOps lifecycle stages. Uh, they're going to look symmetrical with the back end teams. The back end teams have them in the team name. Uh, other individuals have it in their sort of specialty. And this is gonna eventually be symmetrical with PMs. So obviously both departments are growing like crazy, so it's never 100% in sync, but now that we're aligned on, on what it is we're doing here, uh, you're gonna see them be reflected more and more closely. Um, this will give PM dedicated people for planning purposes, so they'll know I've got this many front end people, this many back end people, this many UX people, and that's gonna make their lives significantly easier and hopefully cut down on a certain amount of project management that our product managers have to do today, allow them to focus on, uh, on, on quality. And then all this will, be, uh, this will be public in our team chart, so uh, transparent within the company, but also with the outside world. Um, so this is shipped for UX design. Um, Sarah picked this whole thing up really, really quickly and was able to ship something, I think, earlier this week. Uh, and most of it was done uh, um, last week. Um, so you can see a, a screenshot of our team chart here and you can see a link to the diff where we put this in place. Um, so you can see, for example, um, you know, James on our platform team knows that Chris is his person for, uh, for three UX design and so forth. And then for front end, um, it's a larger department. There is uh, a little bit more complexity here. So we couldn't uh, sim ship, so to speak, the same thing, but um, we have a similar pattern in mind. Um, Tim is working through it and talking to his people and product managers. And what we're hoping to do is ship something um, next week. It looks like we've got something that's really good that should make everybody happy. We just can't quite uh, merge it yet without a few more conversations. Uh, so that's what we're doing about clean interfaces. And the next thing is uh, OKRs. So, um, 
Again, we're limiting ourselves to three for the benefit of focus. Um, I've linked to the issue here where we're authoring OKRs. We've got about three weeks to figure it out. So it feels like plenty of time to set some really good goals for the next quarter. Of course, we still have flexibility as, as business conditions change, as technical things change, we can change throughout the quarter. But I really like to kick the quarter off with solid goals. Um, and uh, we've got a perfect amount of time frame to do that. Um, we're going to do some, uh, yeah, of course, we're going to do hiring OKRs as we always do. Hiring is really important and we need to maintain focus on that. We're going to do some new things this quarter. We're thinking about error budgets. Uh, if anyone has read the Google book about site liability engineering, they have this concept of, of error budgets and we're trying to figure out how to, one, do attribution at the team level, not the individual level, but not the director level, the team level for uh, issues, either outage or degradation on GitLab.com, and then how the uh, individual teams can spend that budget. And uh, different companies do it different ways. So we've got an issue where we're openly discussing um, how that should work. We want to incentivize the right behaviors. We don't want to encourage gamesmanship. We don't want to encourage slowing down or stopping shipping or anything like that. So this is a very important one to sort of word correctly. And attribution, particularly, where we've got a large app, sort of a monolith, can be tricky. Um, so we're, uh, we're going to do an iteration in Q3. And then uh, uh, the other thing I, I posed is, hey, maybe we take, you know, in pr prior to having, you know, con new continuous delivery tooling and things like that, um, what if we just take the current method that we're deploying to GitLab.com via the Omnibus installer we use for ourselves as customers and just start doing it weekly as opposed to monthly? The thinking being uh, deploying smaller chunks of code, whatever that is, is better than bigger chunks of code. And it will help with attribution and it will help with uh, forensics and, and other things. Uh, it's by no means easy though, um, but I think uh, a lot of people are up for that. So we're kind of thinking through what would this mean? What do we have to do? Is it possible? And what exactly would the benefits would be? And we have uh, until uh, we kick off the OKRs to kind of figure this out. And if it looks like a good goal, uh, we're reasonably confident we'll kick it off and we'll figure out the rest kind of iteratively as we go. Uh, so with that, happy to answer questions. Let me stop sharing and I will open up the chat. Um, let's see, yeah, lots of comments about Tom and, Tom and Jerry. Um, that may be too much of an American reference. I don't know if that cartoon goes uh, globally, but yes, we do have directors named Tom and Jerry. And we have a Tommy too. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Brennan says, I love the engineering team is referring to this as clean interfaces. Great analogy for those who understand it. I think this is actually a company wide thing. This is something that Sid is quite passionate about and it's, it's multiple places in our handbook. So we can't take credit for it, but we are kind of channeling our CEO and, uh, and he believes that, you know, naming is one aspect of presenting clear interfaces and that it eases a lot of communication. So we're definitely trying to, uh, to take that to heart and to reflect it. Um, let's see, Tommy says, uh, usually about 30 seconds change. 30 seconds after change goes live, but it's still accurate. Really appreciate the attention that goes into the product categories page, though. It makes it really easy for Dahlia and I to prep for candidates. Yeah, the, uh, this is an issue where the product categories page has been changing very rapidly. And then as uh, on the engineering side, we're supposed to be reflecting it, um, you know, when it's who's on what team, what teams are called, people's titles. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure we're communicating that delivery and people don't feel like their heads are spinning. So we're trying to figure out the right way for engineering to take part in those discussions, subscribe to changes to that page, just so we can all kind of uh, stay, in, stay in sync. Don't want to slow down. We just want to make sure that we're, uh, we're staying in sync and all aligned. Um, Clement says, dang, UX team is iterating fast. Yep, agree. Uh, they're moving really fast, which is great. And Sarah's got some cool plans for Q3, which you'll see in the form of OKRs. Um, Bob says, I think it's worth mentioning that every issue discovered in GCP staging failover an issue that we can avoid in prod. Uh, so we're not standing still in the migration. Um, correct. Yeah, this is all really valuable stuff to be finding. Um, but because it is unknown unknowns, it means our, predict our, our predictability is quite bad. And everybody is, is very curious, customers, executives, internally, when is the date? When is the date? And uh, it's a challenge to um, provide a date and provide confidence in that date when um, you know, we're sort of uh, swimming in a river, um, so to speak. So we've got to find a way to slow down that river or speed up our, our swimming. Um, so the, uh, the, the trend and that burn down is a, um, an accurate fit um, to the curve. And right now the curve is uh, very sort of, you know, flaky and, and linear. So we got to get a handle on that. Um, you know, not shipping it or shipping it slower isn't, a, isn't a, an excuse. But by all means, it's all great information to be finding. These are things that would cause issues in prod, and it's great that we're sussing them out through the act of uh, rehearsals or, or what I would call agile demos. Um, 
let's see. Uh, Philippe says, release weekly. Are deployments going to be predictable, same day, same hour? That's a great question. I would jump in the issue and pose that question, Philippe. Um, you know, to me, this is an iteration towards continuous delivery where small bits go out when they're ready, in which case you kind of care less about dates, but obviously that's a big leap to get there. And so, yeah, we may want to do something that's like on a given day. And you know, one of the goals of this is to decompose the big monthly feature freeze, but it does mean maybe we have to have weekly feature freezes or something like that, because clearly a certain amount of manual QA needs to happen and certain people need to be around. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's likely that we would probably snap to a day or something like that. Maybe we care less about the hour. And that's a good way to sort of like train and prep ourselves and build the habits we're gonna need for true continuous delivery, where it's like, things go out the moment they're ready. And, and ideally the protection team doesn't even know when code is shipping because things are so smooth, but it'll take a while to sort of get there. But I encourage people to jump in that issue and let's get everything on the table about uh, what it would mean to do that. Yeah, well, um, Eric, if I may. Sure. What I wanted to point out, if, uh, if we have a feature that is uh, split on different merge requests, for example, I don't want to be in a position when I merge the first merge request and it depends on other code that is not deployed yet and we have something working in production. So if I know that uh, the, the release point is going to be in one hour, I will wait until the, the, the yeah. production is deployed to merge everything. Well, I... another, another thing we're talking about recently and, and Dahlia sent uh, merge to handbook change and is communicating this out uh, today and, and next week is we need to get to a point where master is sacred and, and pristine and everything on master is proven to be deployable. That's the heart of continuous delivery. So for something like a merge request and on another merge request, um, if there's a time gap between those, you've essentially broken the build and we need to adopt a culture that we never break the build. And that means yeah. configuration branches. It means perhaps a staging branch prior to master where things can be proven out in a specific environment and we, we need to get there. I think that's definitely a part of this. But if you have a feature with front end and back end, if you merge the front end and right away it's going to be, to be in production and after I click on the button to, to merge the back end, we have the front end and not the back end in production. Yeah. So yeah. that's that, this very thin line I want to avoid and make sure that we're not in the disposition. I'm yeah, adding there's, there's, Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I know you've had uh, a lot of thoughts on this. Uh, sorry, just, just real quick. We, we are moving toward the CD vision and part of that is also uh, talking about how we could use something like feature flagging. Uh, we have to get to a place where we're able to do small merge requests uh, that don't break master. And, and one of the ways is using feature flags. There's obvious things that you need to think about. We don't want to end up with thousand feature flags that we have to manage. So I'll add that to the issue and we can discuss there. But I think Philippe, that would help as well. Yeah, yeah I, think, uh, I think feature flags can do this. I think um, integration branches can do this. I think keeping master uh, pure can do this. I think also having a, a separation of concerns between front end and back end. We have a back end API that can evolve on its own and then a front end API that can um, consume it. A lot of what allows to ship back end changes first, front end can come along and consume it after the fact without breaking it. And if the API, API is severed, that's, uh, that's one way to manage these changes as well. So um, lots of different levels at which we can handle these things and uh, many tools in our toolbox to do it. Um, so, hey, Eric, uh, I, I don't, I hear you say, uh, staging branches a staging branch i don't think that's that might not be where we're we're going i think what we want to do is continuous delivery so what gitlab allows is is to have a staging environment for every branch and and to review apps yes Agreed. exactly so so, so it's more about those review app environments than that it's about adding a lot of steps in, be, in before. I think that's the old way of doing things, not the new way. True, yeah, and, uh, and Mech and I have been chatting about this, and that's one of the OKRs that Mech and his team, and specifically Remy, are thinking of taking on, is review apps for every branch in, uh, in the GitLab project, which would be, which would be a, a huge step forward. It's um, a great point, Sid, thanks. For sure, yeah, and uh, feature flags, for sure, uh, not for everything, but for if we know that there's a likelihood of changing, if it's a big change and it's easy to add them, then uh, that makes sense as well. Um, so Philippa, who's uh, one of our uh, current release managers says, it's possible we've been doing it already. Um, yes, uh, but as we're talking through this, we realize that there's a lot more to do to kind of do it in a truer sense, but um, I'm glad that she, one of our release managers in particular is enthusiastic as opposed to dreadful about doing something like this because it is a big change. Um, and let's see. Um, 
Uh, okay, so Sid, a link to the handbook change, um, stable counterparts. So I believe that's the handbook uh, reference I was looking for where uh, interfaces are mentioned. So thanks for posting that. Yeah, it's, we don't call it interfaces because interfaces is pretty generic. It's, it's about your counterpart. It's about the other the person on the other side. And it's not about them being clean, but being stable so that you deal with the same person every time. Obviously, it wants to also make them clean because otherwise no way we can get them stable. But it's, it's just very simply dealing with the same person. So you get to uh, get to build a certain trust and certain credit with each other, uh, which makes all communication easier. Cool. Um, let's see, Dan says, sounds like a great feature, track prod errors uh, to teams so we can predict potential problems and release planning. Um, yes, it's, uh, it's um, a very time tested uh, sort of pattern, but um, difficult to implement in practice without some work, but we definitely want to get there. Um, Yorick has some ideas about, uh, well, if we can't do, you know, line of code level attribution, uh, database tables are a way to start. So we're looking for our kind of first iteration to get better attribution. Um, and that's part of the issue. But if you have ideas, if you have experience, jump in there and we'll figure out what works for GitLab, because this is different at every company that, that tries it in experience. Um, Let's see, John says, for error budgets and attributing problems to a team, I'm worried that we would develop too much into blaming. How can we avoid that? Yeah, great point. We definitely have a, a no blame culture. This is about being better, not about uh, uh, casting blame. Um, this is one of the reasons why we tend to focus on team level attribution, never individual level attribution. Um, and uh, I think it's, you know, it's just something I need to keep reminding people of, of that, like, we want to be better each day and we're not, uh, we're not, you know, seeking out problems. We definitely want to hold people accountable, but that doesn't mean uh, shaming, um, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, Tommy says, if we incur, if we let it turn into a blame game, we're not managing correctly. Yeah, so I, I would say, you know, look to the management structure I just talked about to prevent this from, from happening. If it's happening, it means we are not doing our job as a management team. So hold us accountable for that. Um, Tommy talks about understanding uh, and mitigating risks, not about apportioning blame. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so like one of the things that will, you know, one of the consequences of a team, uh, you know, um, going over the error budget is like, well, they'd have to spend more time on QA or something like that. So it's about dialing them in so that they're shipping fast. Like, um, you know, I, I really want to avoid the phrase like slow down or something like that, because that's not what we do. That's not our culture, but um, dialing in uh, the team's calibration so that they're shipping with the appropriate amount of quality, but still shipping as fast as possible. It's important. Um, this is something that Mac continually beats the drum of is that quality is about moving faster, never moving slower. It does mean spending time on specific things. Um, but at the end of the day, when you're spending a lot of time on forensics, you're spending a lot of time fixing the same bug for the third time, that is wasted velocity and that means shipping slower. Sometimes those things are hidden in your numbers and, and we want to make sure that we're always shipping faster, not slower. Um, let's see, Sean says front end and back end MRs are an anti-pattern. Yeah, I agree. I think we can find a much better way to do this. And we've got, like I said, a few tools in our toolbox to, to do this better. Um, Lots of comments about that, but so by all means, uh, jump in. Uh, do we have an issue about that? I think I think this is maybe a level of detail underneath the weekly releases thing. Maybe we should have a, a separate issue to discuss that. So I'll get that started, and I'll um, email it out to everybody that was on the uh, the FGU, and we can move the discussion there. Or, but yeah, I'll just slide it to the development channel. So anybody passionate about front and back end MRs, uh, I'll post an issue after this to the channel, and uh, and we can have the discussion going there. Um, let's see. Uh, excited to move, see movement towards GraphQL. Uh, yes, it's, it's, APIs in general are great. Uh, GraphQL in particular is an exciting, uh, exciting technology for sure. It's from Andre. Um, Bob says we have underscore version files for pinning versions. Um, so it looks like this is a lot of excited talk about uh, about um, front and back end MRs and uh, handling changes and things like that. So let's get all this into the issue. Um, as long as we get the release train choo-choo, yeah, <laughs> release trains are, uh, again, like, get, you know, release trains to me kind of speak of handoffs and gates and things like that. And so I, I want to try to minimize that release trains. I, I come from a company prior to this that was doing hardware and stuff like that. And, and there was some true waterfall going on there and release train really became a dirty word for me in that experience. And so when I hear release train, I'm like, oh, we, we got to rename that because we want to stay agile and we want to keep moving but fast. It's this is about an automated release train. So not about um, the people all putting their things together. You just press the merge button and GitLab does a release train. 
and yes. it's to make sure you can release faster than uh, your tests are running. So if your tests take 15 minutes, the release train allows you to deploy every less than 15 minutes. Uh, so maybe we could call this like a release monorail or some kind of driverless train or something like that. That would make me a little bit more comfortable because the, the release train. There's a, there's a feature proposal for it. Uh, feel free to make it release MacLav. <laughs> Um, let's see, Kathy says holding teams accountable should definitely not be perceived as blaming, shaming, right? Yeah, especially, you know, for Kathy's world in security, um, uh, there's a ton of learning for us to do and security moves so fast. It's almost like a war of attrition when we find security issues in particular, it's like, Hey, this is a, this is something that we need to learn. And obviously we don't want to repeat, you know, mistakes over and over and over again, but every week there will be some new technique or some new vulnerability. And, uh, and so avoiding uh, blaming and shaming is, uh, Important everywhere, particularly uh, in security. So I'm glad she holds that value. Um, could a product feature help with error budgeting? Um, yeah, I, I think so. There's potential things in monitoring. There's potential things maybe on the Victor's side of the world where we manage our projects in the app that could help with this. So for sure, let's get some feature requests and um, emanating from engineering about what we need to manage our product and our, uh, our um, process efficiently. Uh, will we be iterating on enforcing quality in master? Do we know what the next steps are on that? Um, yes, we will be iterating. I can answer that for sure. Do we know what the next steps are? No, I think that's uh, I think that's up for the current debate. I think we should have that discussion and issue about weekly releases, about um, what enforcement means, uh, and obviously with an eye towards um, uh, you know moving as fast as possible and avoiding the the accountability problem that's been talked about. Uh, Josh linked to the review apps issue. Great. Um, everybody check that out. Add your thoughts there. I think that would unlock a lot of productivity. Um, let's see. Tommy's talking to Philippa. Release Rocket. Yeah, I like that one, Clement. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, now we're, we're getting into jokes about the release train, the release rocket, and release monorail, and stuff like that. Uh, someone says Daniel has figured it out. The release hyperloop. There you go. That's the final answer. <laughs> um, cool. Well, any other uh, any other questions, uh, either verbally or on the Zoom chat before we break? Going once, going twice, sold. Um, fave ice cream, chocolate, obviously. You know, neurotransmitters, endorphins. It's not just a flavor. Um, Cool. Uh, well, everybody, thanks for the feedback. Uh, if you want to get the discussion continuing, join me in my VP channel, jump in some of the issues that I linked to, and let's, uh, let's keep this going. And I'll create that, uh, that new issue for the, the thing that I talked about earlier. Um, cool. All right. Well, uh, have a great day, everybody, and see you in the team call. Cheers.